Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about medical terminology. More specifically, medical terminology that a respiratory therapist will encounter. This is not going to cover nursing medical terminology or any other healthcare terminology. It's going to be specifically to respiratory care. Uh, so stick around if you want to find out more. Hey guys, welcome back. Thank you guys for watching. I'm Daniel from Doldier Media, and today I'm going to be talking about medical terminology. All the people that work at hospitals are usually pretty busy. Uh, you're working a pretty long shift and you have a lot of things going on, and medical words always are like 15 syllables long. So what we do in the healthcare field is we abbreviate everything. We make everything a little bit shorter, and it actually becomes a language of its own. They do teach these classes, so this is not going to be a replacement to any classes. If you're going for respiratory, you're probably going to have to take a medical terminology class. If you're in nursing school or any other school and you want to hear this, you're probably going to still learn this in your programs, but this is just going to be a brief summary. If you're starting your clinicals or if you're curious as to what some words mean, I'm going to kind of go over the most common words that I see during my day, and I'm going to kind of tell you guys what they mean and what they stand for. The reason we abbreviate most medical terms is because medical words are usually Greek or Latin in origin, and Greek words tend to be very informative if you learn the actual meanings of the suffixes and prefixes, but when they start adding up, the words start getting really, really, really long, and it gets to the point where it's not only a mouthful, but it takes a long time to write it out, and sometimes you misspell these words. And so you'll be writing your notes, and instead of writing a note for about 30 minutes, you just use abbreviations and you're going to save yourself five to 10 minutes on average. Now, I'm not going to go over the specific meanings of suffixes and prefixes. I'm just going to go over strictly abbreviations. So an example of an abbreviation is going to be something like ABG, which is an arterial blood gas. And ABG is what we use instead of using the words arterial blood gas. Now, if you go into a class, you're probably going to learn a little bit more in detail definitions such as words like epiglottitis. If you look at the word epi, epi means over. Glottis is the thing that opening in your actual airways and itis means inflammation. So epiglottitis is inflammation of the area above the opening to your airway or something like bronchitis. It's itis, which is inflammation and bronx. So it's inflammation of the bronchia or bronchi. Once you do get a good grip on medical terms, prefixes and suffixes, it kind of makes things a lot more interesting because you could make out what's going on with the patient by just reading the prefixes or suffixes. But with, with that being said, let's start what we're gonna talk about. So as an RT, the first and most common thing you're probably gonna see an abbreviation of is gonna be SVN and MDI. And SVN is a small volume nebulizer. That's what we use to give breathing treatments usually through. Uh, and an MDI is a meter dose inhaler. It's most inhalers are gonna be either an MDI or a DPI. A DPI is a dry powder inhaler, but these abbreviations are gonna be very common for you. So might as well remember them off the bat. These are something that you just need to pretty much memorize. SVN, MDI, and DPI. The next medical abbreviations that I want you guys to remember are going to be your time abbreviations and they're timed for what kind of treatments and how frequent you're going to give the treatments. So the first one that we're going to talk about is going to be Q, uh, a number and then some kind of ending. And this is going to be how frequent you're going to give your medications. Q in this situation means every. Now an example of this would be Q2 PRN. So Q means every. Uh, two, it means hours, and PRN means as needed. The word PR or the abbreviation PRN means as needed. So if anything is ordered as PRN, it means you don't necessarily have to give it at a specific time. It's whenever the patient needs it. So Q2 PRN is every two hours as needed. Another example of this would be Q4 while awake or Q4WA. And that's going to be an abbreviation meaning every four hours while the patient is awake. So this is going to be something you're going to see in the hospital a lot. The letter Q, which again means every, some kind of number followed by that. It could be 12, which means hours. Or if it's specific to minutes, it'll actually say uh, Q20 min. Another form of a timed uh, abbreviation is going to be 
BID, TID, or QID. And it goes like this. BID is BID or twice a day. TID is three times a day. And QID is four times a day. Coming from the Latin and Greek words. I think Latin and Greek words. I'm not sure. Coming from some kind of fancy words that I'm going to have on the board after I'm editing. The next abbreviations also have to deal with time. Now, they're not going to be as specific as Q4 or Q2 hours, but what they are going to be is a set time frame, which you're going to have to deliver medication through. So most commonly, you'll see BID, which is twice a day, or you'll see TID or QID. So QID is going to be four times a day, TID is three times a day, and BID is twice a day. Most inhalers are BID, things that are going to be when a patient wakes up and when a patient goes to sleep, you're going to give that BID. So if you ever encounter BID, that means twice a day. The next common abbreviations that you're gonna encounter are gonna be ways that you administer oxygen therapy to a patient. So starting with the most simple one is RA, which is room air. So a patient's just breathing room air, they're not on any kind of oxygen or any kind of supplemental uh, help from you. Uh, after RA, you get NC. NC is very common, it's just nasal cannula. Typically, when you're going to be charting or you're going to be writing some kind of note, you're going to write the patient was on 2LNC, which is 2 liters nasal cannula. Um, it just kind of means the patient's on 2 liters via nasal cannula. Another one after nasal cannula that you're going to see quite often is going to be something like an, a non-rebreather, which is NRB. Uh, if a patient's going through some kind of distress or anything else is going on and they need a lot of oxygen at that time, or prior to intubation, you're gonna put them on a non-rebreather. When you're making your note, you're gonna put NRB, the patient was on an NRB, which is a non-rebreather. After that, if you have a trach patient, you're gonna put uh, CAM. CAM stands for a cool aerosol mist or cool air mist. It's very common to put uh, a patient that's trached or a patient that has some kind of upper airway inflammation where they need either racemic or some kind of uh, cool air just to lower the inflammation in the area of the vocal cords or anywhere in that area, that region. Another one you might see is HFNC, which is high flow nasal cannula, or sometimes you might see it as high velocity nasal cannula, HVNC. Uh, it's just, instead of writing out the whole sentence, we uh, put people on a high amount of oxygen through a nasal cannula. That water is usually humidified, sometimes it's heated, and so that patient's on an HFNC, high flow nasal cannula. If you encounter that, that's what that means. The next set of abbreviations you're gonna encounter are gonna be the ones that you're gonna see on the monitor. And so starting from the top to bottom, it depends on what kind of hospital you work at, you're gonna have HR, which is heart rate. You're gonna have BP, which is blood pressure. You're gonna have SpO2, which is the saturation of oxygen in your blood through an infrared sensor that usually is on a finger or earlobe. And SpO2 just means how much oxygen the patient has in their bloodstream at that given time. It is a guess, but it's still SpO2 is what you're going to see. Beyond that, you're going to see something like FiO2. FiO2 is a uh, frequency of inhaled oxygen. And what that means is how much oxygen are you delivering through some kind of other device. Typically, if it's a nasal cannula, it's measured in liters. But if it's something like a ventilator or a BiPAP, you're going to put them on a FiO2. And it's usually in a percentage. So the amount of air or oxygen that's being delivered to them is 50%. And that's how it's measured. So FiO2. Another one you're going to see is RR, which is respiratory rate. And in some places, it's written as F, which stands for frequency. But that's how many times the patient's breathing in a minute. These are common things you're going to see on an actual monitor. So get used to seeing those. So the next series of abbreviations you're going to encounter are going to be most commonly encountered in places like the ICU or ED, uh, which ED stands for emergency room, ICU stands for intensive care unit. Uh, these places are going to be a little bit more, again, intense, like I mentioned in a previous video. So you are going to see some things that you don't normally see on the floors. Something you're going to see is going to be GCS. GCS is Glasgow Coma Scale. So this typically tells you how well a patient is. If it's eight or under, typically you're gonna intubate the patient. If it's more than eight, then chances are the patient's okay, but there's still gonna be a high chance that you might intubate them if it's a lower number. The higher the number, the better, the lower the number, the worse. 
but this is something you will see most often in emergency situations or trauma situations. Next abbreviation is SBT. Uh, if the patient's intubated, before extubating the patient and taking them off a ventilator, you're gonna do a spontaneous breathing trial, and that's SBT. A spontaneous breathing trial is just something that you put a patient uh, on some kind of pressure support on a very low setting, and you see how well they're doing. There's certain numbers you look for, but it's called a spontaneous breathing trial or SBT. After this, there's gonna be certain tests you're gonna see, things like AFB, which is acid fast bacilli test. Uh, if a patient is suspected of having tuberculosis, there's a specific test you have to do, which is called an AFB test. And what happens is you get the actual uh, sputum or secretions from that patient. The actual bacteria, because it's an acid fast bacilli, it doesn't work like an average bacteria. It has a waxy layer. So there's different tests and a different way of finding out if that's what it is. So AFB is acid fast bacilli. And most commonly, it's going to be seen with uh, tuberculosis. After that, we already mentioned ABG, which is arterial blood gas. This is something that you do to draw from a patient's arteries to see how well they're oxygenating and ventilating. If you're reading a patient's chart and you see the doctor ordered ABX, ABX is antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics, again, it's not too long of a word, but it is abbreviated to ABX. And once there's three or four different antibiotics on board, it does get a little bit cumbersome writing antibiotics over and over, so it's abbreviated with ABX. Another one you're gonna see, and this one you can see anywhere in the hospital, is gonna be NPO. This is gonna be written outside of the door of the patient room. It's gonna be written on the board in the room, and sometimes it's gonna be hanging over their bed. NPO means nothing by mouth. Uh, the actual words are written on the screen right now. It's like not per osis or something like that. I'm not sure, because I'm not a nurse. But it means nothing by mouth. So what, what happens is, if a patient has to go to some kind of surgery, or they have a procedure where they can't have any liquids or any foods, then for a certain amount of hours, they're not allowed to eat anything because they need to have a clean intestine and a clean stomach. And if that's the case, you're gonna see it written on their door. You can't give them any kind of water. A lot of times these patients do ask for water and you don't even look at the NPO and you give it to them and you get in trouble by the nurse. So NPO means nothing by mouth and it's very important that you don't give that patient any kind of liquid or any kind of food. And the last abbreviations that I'm going to go over to today. And if you guys like this, I could have a part two for you. Let me know. I do want your feedback. Does this help you? Has this helped you? Uh, let me know what, what you feel about this in the comments down below. But the next ones are going to be abbreviations about certain disease processes or sicknesses. So the first one you're going to see that's going to be very common for you is going to be COPD. COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. This is a very common uh, problem right now in the United States and in the world. This is, I think, second or third cause of death in the U.S. And chronic obstructive pulmonary disease encompasses two different disease processes. You have emphysema and chronic bronchitis. And people who smoked most of their lives are going to be the highest at risk for developing COPD. So people who smoke, they actually don't get cancer as much as they get COPD. There's almost a guarantee if somebody smoked, there's like a very high chance they're gonna have COPD. There also is a genetic reason why somebody gets this with a, a certain protein, alpha-1 uh, antitrypsin deficiency, but uh, the most commonly encounters you're gonna have is with people who used to smoke when they were younger and now they're in their 50s and 60s and they're having a hard time breathing. Another one you're gonna see that's very common to see in the hospital is CHF. And CHF is congestive heart failure. This is for patients who always had high blood pressure, whether it was in their pulmonary arteries or their regular arteries. And that high blood pressure caused their heart to grow enlarged. And now it doesn't pump the same. And because the heart doesn't pump the same, there's a lot of uh, fluid that gets built up in the veins. And these people usually have inflamed or edemous legs. Uh, they have swollen legs. Sometimes the water gets in their lungs and they can't breathe. They feel like they're drowning. So CHF is something you will encounter. You're going to see OSA a lot. OSA is obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, these are the people that you're going to put on CPAPs at night or BiPAPs at night. Anybody who stops breathing for any period of time is most likely going to be diagnosed with a form of sleep apnea. There are two sleep apneas, obstructive or central. 
central sleep apnea has nothing to do with the person's weight or anything else. It actually has more to do with the nerves that are sending wrong signals and the patient stops breathing at night. But obstructive sleep apnea, which is very common, is when somebody has a little bit too much tissue over their um, chest or their neck, or sometimes they could be really skinny, but they just don't have a, uh, the ability to keep their airway open at night. And that's called obstructive sleep apnea because it causes an obstruction and that's what causes the apnea, which means not breathing. A means no, pnea means breathing. So apnea means not breathing. Next you have ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, this is gonna be a patient who their lungs just kind of give up on them. Uh, we've seen this a lot with the pandemic. A lot of people have been in the ARDS. There are certain parameters to measure it. It's a very complicated disease process, but you are gonna see it if you're reading some notes or maybe you're writing your own notes. Uh, it's ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, next one is gonna be ILD. It's gonna be interstitial lung disease. And you also might see that it says idiopathic at times. Idiopathic means that it's no, we don't know the cause of it. It just kind of happened. And interstitial lung disease is when fibers start developing on your lungs and the capacity goes down and people have a hard time breathing. Uh, this thing could happen from people that have uh, inhaled asbestos or certain different things cause interstitial lung disease. And it's a very difficult disease to work with and it's very hard to fix. It's irreversible and you really have to manage it very carefully. You'll see CF. This is for cystic fibrosis. It's an obstructive pulmonary disease also. Uh, usually these patients are going to be a lot younger. Um, people that have CF have a problem with their sodium channels, but you're going to see CF and you're going to have a lot of work with these patients. After this, you have HTN, which is hypertension. You're either going to have pulmonary hypertension on a patient written or regular hypertension. And finally, uh, you're going to have PNA. Probably the most common thing you're going to see as an RT. PNA is pneumonia. Anytime you see that, it's PNA. That's the abbreviation for writing pneumonia. I do know that it's pretty challenging spelling pneumonia, especially when you're in a hurry. Is it U first? Is it E first? Who knows? You just write PNA. Thank you guys for watching. If you guys like this, let me know in the comments. Please subscribe to my channel. Have a good week.